All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the August Recreational Astronomy Night uh, here at the Ontario Science Centre. Uh, my name's Tom Luton. I'll be your Master of Ceremonies. Um, we've got a fairly good lineup tonight. Uh, we've got Andy Beaton, Beaton talking about the sky this month, Blake Nancaro, Missing Data, Measuring Double Stars, and uh, Mehdi Bozore will be exploring the Kuiper Belt with New Horizons. Before we get started, though, um, anyone here for the first time? Welcome. Uh, this is one of two types of meetings. Uh, we also have a speaker's night, which will be starting up uh, in September. And that's when we're going to have a professional member of the astronomical community come out and give us a chat. Uh, before we get started, though, our president, Ralph Chu, would like to make a couple of announcements. OK, one of the uh, pleasant duties of the president is to recognize contributions of members uh, over the years, and tonight I'm very pleased to be able to uh, present a uh, Ontario Volunteer Service Award to Lila Zikmanis, uh, marking 10 years of uh, service to the uh, Toronto Centre. So Lila, if you could come up. So uh, that's the pleasantry. Now uh, for the um, sort of unpleasant part of it. Uh, last meeting I announced that Peter Hiscox uh, was not doing very well uh, and uh, we all signed a card to send to him uh, to try and cheer him up. Um, I'm sorry to have to tell you that on August 1st uh, Peter lost his fight against pancreatic cancer and uh, uh, passed on and uh, there was a um, uh, a memorial, uh, what I, I guess best described as a block party at his home last week. And uh, I attended, and at that time I presented uh, his wife Dorothy with the uh, uh, Ostrander Ramsey Award certificate that uh, we had conferred on Peter uh, this spring. So I'd like you to rise for a moment of silence in memory of Peter Hiscox. Thank you very much. Uh, if any of you are interested, uh, the national office is uh, going to be setting up a special fund in memory of uh, Peter to uh, devote the uh, donations to uh, uh, efforts to combat light pollution. So uh, we'll have more about that later once the uh, paperwork's been taken care of. OK, thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so uh, first off, uh, Andy Beaton will be doing this guy this month. Andy. Hi, uh, Sky This Month. Um, my voice is sounding a bit funny. I'm uh, fighting off a bit of a cold. I'm uh, up to here with uh, cold pills, so if I start raving about giant bats and the planet Nibiru, that's probably why. <laughs> Coming up this, tonight, uh, the big picture, planetary highlights, lunar highlights, dark nebula this time around, comets and meteors, variable stars, double star. You there, Blake? Yep. <laughs> and uh, what's coming up in space flight. I'm thinking uh, next time just to shake things up, I'm going to start throwing in deliberate lies just to keep people on their toes and not being bored. So this is what the uh, sky is looking like. Uh, this evening, uh, assuming it actually gets that dark in the city, we've got uh, Jupiter over here uh, getting down towards the horizon. Uh, Saturn and Mars are uh, right up, uh, we're a good, good place to see. Uh, the good summer constellations are starting to set, uh, Sagittarius and Scorpius. 
and uh, when we get to, to the morning and later in the month, uh, looking off to the east, we actually start to see those winter constellations appear in Gemini, Canis Major. Um, it doesn't show, but Orion's uh, just off to the left of that screen. Oh, no, there's Orion right in the middle there. And we're talking about the cold pills. <laughs> so if you're interested in staying up late, you can get an early start on your winter constellations. Um, if you're doing anything like your uh, Messe certificate or your finest NGC, and you don't like being out in the cold, your option is uh, getting up early. The nights are getting longer. Um, twilight ends at uh, 10 o'clock tonight. It'll start again at 4 in the morning. By the uh, next meeting time, it will end uh, just before 9 o'clock and uh, start at just about 5 o'clock. So we're getting a couple extra hours of observing time. Uh, that's good news for uh, uh, imagers who want to be out for a couple extra hours and uh, get as many uh, photons as you can. Important day is coming up. Uh, the new moon will be on September 9th. Uh, the moon will be at Apogee on the 23rd and Perigee on uh, September 8th. Um, for the new people, I like to point this out because if you're ever interested in taking pictures of the moon, um, take a picture of the moon on one date and the other and uh, compare them in scale. You can see how close and how far the moon gets away from the Earth. And it's surprising how much it is. We have an occultation of Aldebaran by the moon on September 3rd. I don't think it's visible here. I think you need to be up in northern Quebec, northern Northwest Territories to uh, see that. But uh, bring it to your uh, attention just in case anybody's traveling or just in case anybody is uh, watching this video from uh, north of 60. Uh, star party season is still going on. Um, I know there are a couple of star parties uh, not affiliated with the RASC coming up in the next few weeks. Um, but I can't tell you exactly which ones they are off the top of my head. Um, August 28th, uh, Mars is stationary. Uh, if you like to track planets moving through the sky, and who doesn't, um, that's the point where Mars stops uh, heading towards the sun from our point of view st and starts backing away. Uh, if you're interested in uh, tracking it and uh, proving to yourself that the planets travel in elliptical orbits around the sun, uh, this is your big opportunity. Well, come on, who doesn't? The moon, uh, first quarter, August 18th, full moon, August 26th, uh, last quarter, September 3rd, and the new moon on September 9th. Um, I know that uh, if you're a deep sky imager, uh, the full moon is your enemy, but uh, there are lunar certificates to be earned for uh, uh, getting out there and, and looking for the interesting features on the moon, of which there are many. Uh, the next Lunar X is on August 18th. Unfortunately, it's uh, two in the afternoon here, but it should be visible with a reasonable telescope. Uh, for new people in the club who uh, don't know what the Lunar X is, it's a, a feature on the moon where you have an intersection of two crater walls. And when they're illuminated from a certain angle, they look like an X. And here's a picture of it. You see there's the X uh, right there. I'm not sure if it's all that scientifically interesting, but it is, it's fun to look for. And, you know, it's always nice to have a, a target to drag yourself out of the house and uh, go searching for it on a clear night. The planet's coming up. Um, Mercury will be visible in the morning in late August. Uh, that's about it. The rest of the time it will be too close to the sun for us to view from around here. Uh, Venus you may have noticed, is getting closer to the uh, sun and lower in the sky each uh, night as, uh, as the sun sets. Um, it's still amazingly brilliant. You can't miss it. Um, I was looking at it uh, a few days ago, and it is still clearly a half Venus. Um, it is approaching us, so it will be growing bigger and growing more crescenty. 
trying to remember which way it's going. I think we, it's going more crescenty, but I have to check that. You can also check it yourself with any kind of uh, planetarium software or just looking it up in the observer's handbook. In the morning, um, not only will Mercury be visible for a while, but uh, Neptune and Uranus are also visible. Um, Uranus in uh, Aries and uh, Neptune in Aquarius. Uh, Neptune in is at opposition on September 7th, so that's going to be the best time of the year to view it. Uh, with a modest telescope, you'll be able to see the disk. Um, a few moons uh, should be visible if you have the largest telescope, like 12 inches or bigger. Um, anything smaller than that, you'll be lucky to see Triton orbiting Neptune. Other than that, uh, you're probably not going to see much in the way of uh, outer planet moons. Mars is still uh, well worth having a look at, and uh, I think it's about 93% of its peak right now, and it's going to be getting uh, further and further away as time goes on, but it's still pretty spectacular. It's very bright if you happen to be looking south uh, around uh, once things get dark. I'm pretty sure I saw some features on the weekend. Uh, the uh, polar caps were obvious, well, one polar cap was obvious, and I'm pretty sure I saw Sirtis Major. Um, the dust storm seems to have subsided, so uh, features should be becoming more and more visible. Um, Ron was talking about uh, using different filters to look for uh, different features uh, through the dust storm, and I wonder, did anybody try that over the past month, and did they have any luck? Did they? Did it work? Okay. Well, it's always worth trying. Uh, the big planets, uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Um, Jupiter is getting a bit uh, closer to the uh, horizon at sunset now. Uh, that's uh, bringing up Saturn as the big showcase planet. And I'll be honest, it always has been my favorite. It's just too fun to look at. Uh, the rings are wide open. Um, good time to look for the Cassini gap. It should be obvious with any modest telescope. Uh, with a larger telescope, probably 12 inches or better, you may, able to, may be able to see the NK gap as well. I have seen it in an 8-inch telescope. Um, the seeing was amazing that night, and uh, Saturn was much higher in the sky than it is now. But it's uh, still worth uh, making the attempt. You know, at the worst, you're going to see Saturn. Jupiter is uh, you know, not as spectacular in my view, but it's still pretty good. Um, people have been reporting that uh, the uh, great red spot is uh, smaller than usual, but the color is more intense. Uh, it's redder than it's been in a long time. Um, when I was looking at it uh, on the weekend, I didn't see the great red spot. It was on the wrong side of the planet, but I'm be curious to uh, see if other people have that experience and uh, whether they've had any luck spotting the, uh, the GRS. Uh, Pluto is uh, still in Sagittarius, so it's going to be a tough find. It's uh, surrounded by an awful lot of stars brighter than it is. Uh, I would not call it a visual target, but if you're a patient person and want to take photos night after night and compare them, uh, your odds are pretty good that you'll be able to pick it up. I think it's somewhere in the 14th magnitude uh, range right now. And it's probably not going to get any better for a few years at least until it gets out of the Milky Way. Uh, the other minor planet we can see from, uh, from Earth easily, uh, Ceres, is getting too close to the Sun for reasonable observation. The other ones are all... Uh, out in the Kuiper belt, and uh, they're pretty much out of reach of anything any of us have in the way of telescopes. For deep sky stuff this, uh, this month, I've decided to uh, poke around in the, the world of dark nebula, because uh, they hardly ever get mentioned. Uh, the easiest ones to see, what you need to do is get out of the city somewhere where you can see the, uh, the Milky Way. 
And once you can see the Milky Way, you can see the big black rift going down the middle of it. And that is the uh, biggest and most obvious of the dark nebula. It's uh, the Cygnus and Vulpecula rifts. Um, the Milky Way should be solid stars along there. The fact that it isn't means that we're looking at uh, clouds of uh, cold, dark hydrogen gas and dust and what other uh, crap is floating around in the Milky Way that hasn't been turned into stars yet. M8 and M20, the Trifid and Sagittarius, uh, the Trifid and Lagoon Nebula and Sagittarius are both excellent places to go looking for uh, dark nebula because they are nice bright uh, nebula to start with and you can clearly see the uh, dark streaks out in front of it. So once again, you've got uh, you know, spectacular things to look at as well as uh, your interested target. Uh, the Northern Coal Sack and Barnard's E Cloud are both uh, recommended objects in the list of dark nebula you, you'll find near the back of your observer's handbook. They are lousy urban targets. Uh, I don't think I'd even bother trying to find them in the city, but uh, if you're out in the country, if you can get out in the country, get out to the uh, observing night out at Long Sioux, then you should have no problem finding uh, any of these uh, big, obvious uh, dark nebula. My favorite uh, dark nebula is uh, LDN 935, and uh, you know it best as the Gulf of Mexico in the North American nebula. Um, the North American nebula is, you know, it's bright and big and interesting, but uh, the reason it makes a good uh, tourist target for uh, amateur astronomers is because it does look so much like North America, and it's that uh, Gulf of Mexico feature that makes it, uh, that gives it that resemblance. Uh, it can be seen in binoculars. In theory, it should be visible in the naked eye. I haven't been able to manage it. Uh, my eyes are not that great. I'm, has anybody here had a any luck finding the North American Nebula naked eye? Blake has? Maybe? Okay. So then if you've seen the North America, you've inadvertently seen uh, the dark nebula that goes with it. And there's a picture of it. And uh, that, there's that uh, obvious uh, Gulf of Mexico in between uh, Florida and Mexico there. And there's a ton of uh, glowing red nebulosity behind it, which you can uh, find with your uh, infrared telescopes. But the fact that we can't see it tells that there's a, a cold, dark nebula in front of it. So comets and meteors coming up uh, this month. Uh, the Perseids are just passed, but uh, we should be seeing some stragglers showing up for the next few days if you happen to be out uh, under a clear sky. Probably a few fireballs straggling along, but you're going to have to wait for them. Um, I think we're well past the point where we're getting a, a meteor a minute. I think we'll probably be getting a, a good meteor an hour now. But they're still out there, so if you are out observing, it's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, one good comet for us, 21P Jacobini Zinner. Uh, right now it's in Cassiopeia. It's a pretty bright object in a telescope, visible in binoculars. I haven't seen it with the naked eye or heard of anyone who can't see it. Um, eighth magnitude was what I was told. Um, it's hard to estimate the brightness of a comet because it's all smeared out. But that would seem to be a reasonable uh, estimate. It's supposed to be at perihelion in September, where some people are claiming it will reach naked eye brightness. Um, I should have a big disclaimer here, no promises. Um, comments are what they are. <laughs> you can't go home without a variable star. Uh, our Pegasi is uh, one I've picked this time. Uh, Pegasus is a nice prominent constellation in uh, the evening sky. It's by 10 o'clock, it's up there and good and, good and obvious. Uh, it's a, 
U Geminorum symbiotic variable, which means you've got a uh, giant star orbiting around a white dwarf. The white dwarf is uh, sucking material out of the loosely held outer atmosphere of the giant. It goes spiraling down in an accretion disk, and as it's spiraling down, uh, clumps of it will spontaneously start uh, fusion and ignite, and uh, the brightness will go up by a few magnitudes almost overnight. Um, it's very close to a 12.6 magnitude comparison star. If your uh, telescope can get down to 12.6 easily, uh, it's a very good uh, object to look for. Uh, one of the reasons is because uh, it's got a very convenient uh, uh, comparison star, almost exactly the same brightness, so you can tell with a second's glance whether it's an outburst or not. Uh, I do like these symbiotic variables as uh, targets for variable stars. Um, the reason is that uh, the long period variable stars are pretty much being observed by automated star program. They, you know, get a computerized telescope that uh, will take an image every three days. And over the course of several months, that long gentle curve will be picked up by a robot and no human involvement is necessary. These guys are much better because uh, they can uh, change uh, you know, three to five magnitudes overnight. And that's something where the automated programs are not uh, responsive enough to catch up to it. So that's, uh, that's a niche still open to uh, human observers. And I recommend that everybody uh, with an interest in contributing to science uh, get involved in that. Uh, the double star I picked this time was uh, 59 Serpens. Uh, nice and uh, overhead, it's in the, uh, in the Milky Way. The reason I picked it was because I couldn't find it when I first looked for it uh, a couple nights ago out at Starfest. I was looking for it with a 26 uh, millimeter eyepiece. I found the, uh, the brighter of the two stars but couldn't find the second. Um, I increased the magnification and found it and decided that it was a suitably challenging star to make it interesting for people to look for without uh, being so challenging that only the, the most brilliant of experts would be able to find it. Coming up, uh, space flight. Yep, only one uh, Falcon launch coming up. Uh, that's August 23rd. Um, Go to YouTube, we'll see if they uh, try landing the booster again. Um, that's the only part that excites me about Falcon launches anymore, otherwise they're pretty much routine. A couple of Ariane launches uh, from the ESA. Um, the ISS will be uh, passing over in early morning, starting on August 29th until uh, the next meeting, uh, 4 to 5 o'clock. Um, if you're up looking for Mercury or you're looking for uh, objects in uh, Orion, uh, keep an eye for, out for a passing overhead. Uh, the exact times, as always, are on heavensabove.com. You can input your own location. It will give you the correct times. And the other big question about space flight uh, right now is uh, the Opportunity rover on Mars. Um, since the big dust storm, it has not resumed communicating with uh, the Earth for the uh, Earth-born uh, observers uh, trying to... Uh, do their, their Mars exploration with it. Um, it'll be worth keeping an eye on it over the next few weeks to see if they uh, do manage to reestablish contact or whether that uh, extremely long-running rover is uh, finally finished. And uh, that's what we have tonight. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, I guess uh, that's it. Thank you very much.
Ready? Ready? All right. Good evening. My name is Blake Nankaro, uh, and uh, I wanted to talk this evening about uh, double stars. Um, actually, uh, take our discussion a bit further than uh, before. Back in February, I don't know if you saw my presentation then, if you've seen it online or you were here, but back then I was talking about how you could observe double stars just for fun, uh, for uh, their colors, for uh, maybe some challenges um, when, when observing, as Andy indicated, uh, sometimes you may not see uh, the faint companion um, to a star, but I, that's something that I like about them is going back to them or, or returning to them. But I, I wanted to kind of kick it up a notch this time. I wanted to talk about how you might measure um, double stars. The, the same way that amateur astronomers can contribute to science, uh, can do citizen science, uh, perhaps from their backyard, double star observers can similarly collect data and submit that, and it can contribute to the body of knowledge that we have about double stars, but that in turn can be used to give us information about star systems, the masses of stars, um, orbital details of those star systems, and that in turn helps us with stellar classifications um, of stars, helps us refine the distances to stars, which is used in the cosmic ladder. So there, there's actually quite a lot that you can do that you can uh, contribute to, to um, th this sort of hobby. So again, uh, back in February, um, I talked about sort of looking at double stars just for fun, um, for, uh, 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 for, for their beauty, for their colors. Um, and, and I reminded people, or wanted to remind people, that double star observing can be done anywhere, anytime, partly because we're, we're looking at starlight, thin, uh, beams of light um, can punch through light pollution. So you can do it in your backyard very easily. You don't have to drive out of town. Um, but again, I wanted to talk about how you might measure double stars. Now, you can do things very casually. I, I don't want to uh, suggest you have to spend a lot of money and buy a lot of accessories, although you, you probably are going to do that anyway. But... <laughs> You, you can casually measure double stars just by keeping good notes. You're supposed to do that, right? You're supposed to keep good log notes and things like that. Paul, Paul Markov, who is not here this evening, he, he's an advocate of that. I, I just do that. I'm always keeping detailed notes of my observing sessions. This, this shows you a sketch um, that I did of uh, Miram or Myram, um, Eta Persei, and I noted the, the stars where I've annotated this diagram to show the A, B, C, and D stars. And if you look near the top right of that sketch, you'll see that I've also noted the direction, um, the east direction. And by inference, I know because I made a note about the telescope and that I was using a mirror diagonal, I can figure out or I know where north is. It happens to be, I don't show it in this diagram, but it happens to be up near the top left, sort of the 11 or 10 o'clock position in that in that sketch. Uh, but looking back at this sketch, I can assess how far apart those stars are, roughly. And, and I can get the angles of the B star and the D star and so on in comparison to the A. So if you do a good sketch and then you refer to that later, you might be able to get some good information about, about those stars. So you can do a very casual form of measurement. And if you look at something like a binary system, um, that can be very interesting because they may change over time. I don't know if you know this or have thought about this, but some double star systems that are interacting, that are binary systems, that is to say uh, um, one star orbits around another star, that they may have periods that are 50 years, 100 years, so that means if you go back every year, every season, and you look at that star again, and you compare it, its new or current position, to your previous notes, or you do sketches each year, 
and you compare those sketches and you do a flip book, <laughs> you might see the stars or you can detect from your notes that the stars are changing. Um, did you know that Sheraton or Beta Eretus, the second brightest star in Aries, has a period of 107 days? So that means you can look at it a few times in the same season. And in theory, you can see the B star moving around the A star. Now, a lot of binaries are very close, so you may have to use very high magnification, but that's a cool thing. That was one of the things I mentioned in my first presentation, that binaries are dynamic, um, that they're changing. Some of, them, some of them change. So we're interested in binaries. Th these are the ones that we want to measure. Um, this might, for some people, m make a shift or or be perceived as a change um, in observing, that it's becoming work. <laughs> Dave Cotterell, who's um, an active double star observer in the North York Astronomy Association, he says, I'm going to work tonight. And that means he's using his telescope and doing some measurement of, of double stars. So you may not like that sort of aspect of it. Um, but if we, if we take two measurements, it's easy to do. Uh, we, we measure the angle that the stars are in relation to one another a and how far apart the stars are from one another, the separation, and you do that repetitively and keep good notes, then you can collect some good data. And almost immediately you could, if you wanted, calculate the mass of the total system. With those two numbers, we can start to do that. Preliminary orbital data can allow us to calculate um, the mass of the system. More complex math is needed. You don't have to do that. I'm, I'm not strictly interested in that, but more complex formulas can determine the full orbit and we can start to get the masses of the individual systems when we do spectroscopy and so on. But, but just getting those two numbers starts to fill in some important information about binary star systems. So it's, Im it's important data. Ron Tangway, who is a notable double star observer and contributes to Sky and Telescope magazine, he said, because so few professionals remain in the field, qualified amateurs are badly needed. So, so you can help, you can contribute here. This is something that's easy to do. Um, uh, if you were to look at some stars over a long period of time, I'm not suggesting that you do this strictly, but if you were to observe a bright pair of stars over a long period of time, you might notice that they're moving, but maybe not around each other. They might be moving in relation to the background stars. So this image here is showing you um, the image of these bright stars over about a 50-year period. Um, first shots in 1954, second ones just a few years ago. Um, and I'll, let me do a doodle here if I can. Um, that the small star kind of ends up over here and the bright star kind of ends up over here. Do you see that compared to the two sketches? So this star is moving, oops, that direction, I'm trying to do some little arrows here, um, and that star is moving that direction. So these two stars are moving through space uh, together. They're like two dolphins swimming off the bow of a ship going the same direction or going the same speed. Uh, we're, we're not interested in these, per se. These are stars that show high proper motion, uh, and these we sort of discount. Um, they, you can see that these st two stars in relation to each other, if I can get the centers here, and the distance that they are from each other, the, that angle and that separation doesn't, to me, doesn't appear to be changing. It may be, but, but these tar two stars just seem to be moving through space together. Um, they're not uh, going around each other. So there's no change, no apparent change in their angle or their separation, okay? So those ones we're not interested in. We want to focus in on stars that are binary systems um, that appear to be going around one another. So once again, if you looked at two stars over a long period of time and you saw that one was moving closer to the other star and then far away, um, uh, the angle of it was changing over time, then you know you're on to something. Now, I, I forget where I got this image. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, and you can see those. there's multiple observations, though, the little green pluses, and then there's other observations that are photographic. 
um, with the blue dots and the purple dots and so on. But let, let's say the first observation was out here um, of the B star. So it's quite far away from the A and it has a certain angle, whatever, whatever that is. And, and let's say we look at it 10 years later and multiple observations are coming in, so it's over here. There may, may, be, it may be very difficult to determine if the angle changed early on, but we can see it's much closer. It's a, it's a third of the way closer um, to the other star. Another 10 years pass, and we look at it again, and the angle is markedly different now. Um, and, and it's much, much closer. And, and then another 10 years later, it may be so close, in fact, to the A star, we can't, we can't see it anymore. Um, we, we may lose sight of the secondary star, but a few years later it shows up again, and it's, it's clearly on the other side. Now the angle is this way, as opposed to this way. So, so when we see that, when we see a star um, changing its position, its angle, um, and the distance from another star, with actually remarkably few measurements, we can get a preliminary orbit and then we can start to calculate mass and things like that. So this is a lot like mo moons around planets, it's like objects in our solar system, the, and the physics is the same. It's Kepler physics all happening here. So, so these are the ones that we want to measure or, or maybe uh, photograph. When, when we start to see these arcs, then we know that there's orbits going on. Um, there's some famous ones, um, Sirius, uh, has a faint companion, Series B or Pup. Anybody seen it? Anybody seen the Pup star? It's very, very challenging um, because it, the A star is so bright and the B star is very dim, but you can see it It helps if it's far away um, in its orbit. But in 1992, 93, people were probably very challenged at spotting um, the star there. But in the late 60s and 70s, I don't know where it is right now currently, in that path, but we could figure that out. Um, uh, so uh, uh, repetitive observations allow us to get more and more data. This also, this image reminds me, to remind you, that visual observing of double stars is still quite relevant from the point of view that the human eye has extraordinary dynamic range. Ralph Chu will, will uh, assure us of that um, compared to um, uh, 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 chips or detectors in camera equipment which don't have as extensive um, or as broad a dynamic range. That's getting better and better all the time, but it's still worthy some of these types of uh, targets for visual observation because of what the eye can detect. So that's kind of cool. Bit of early history, really, really quickly. Um, it, it was actually John Michel uh, back in the 1700s that first suggested that stars might be related, that they might be gravitationally interactive. And that, that was kind of a radical thought at the time, but we, d we don't think twice about that now. Um, that's sort of common knowledge. Uh, William Herschel started observing um, double stars, and in the early 1800s he had um, taken measurements of many and recorded the changes in relative position. So he saw stars moving around each other. Um, Felix Savory in 1827, he computed the first orbit of a binary system. So you can see that double star observation has been going on for a long time. The golden age was in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, now we have the Washington Double Star Database. This is the warehouse where all the double star data is collected and you can easily look up. Um, information there. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of entries in the WDS, but remarkably we have very few stars in that catalog where we have good known obvious or orbital data. So, so there's a lot of gaps. There's a lot of missing data. We need more data there. Um, they, they actually the, the stewards of that database, they actually note stars as neglected double stars. So you can look up the neglected list, and these are ones where there hasn't been data collected for the last 100 or 200 years, um, or, or the data is confusing that current observations don't show a double star where, where it was noted. Um, so, so they appeal to um, amateur astronomers to, to look for this, to go after those neglected double stars, to get current data, to fill the gaps, um, to get more current information. So again, you can add to this legacy.
pr pretty easily. Um, uh, I don't suggest you get one of these. This, this, is the, this is what people used in the old days. Um, this is a Filar instrument. It's got two wires in it, may, maybe four, um, but one is fixed and, and those dials and knobs can move one of the wires um, or, or they're, they're opposed. So you can move one up and down, move the other one up and down and the whole thing can be rotated so you can get angles. If you could find one of these, they're probably very expensive. These old antiques, I can't speak to the quality of them. I've never looked through one of these, but that, that's what er, the early astronomers used um, to, to measure um, double stars. Um, the, the modern solution, it's not too expensive, is to get an astrometric eyepiece, and it has graduations in, in, a, in a reticule that you can use to assess distances and angles, and I'll, I'll show you some of those. Um, I've been looking around for do-it-yourself solutions, you know, I like doing that, but I, ha I haven't found any that are really compelling. So you want to measure two things. I mentioned this before. You need the um, position angle and you need the separation. Separation, sometimes called sep, um, is uh, formally measured with the Greek character uh, symbol rho, and um, we measure that in arc seconds. Um, e even very wide doubles are typically shown in arc seconds, 300 or 320 arc seconds or something like that, as opposed to switching immediately to arc minutes. Um, the angle, of course, we use degrees for that. Um, it's officially noted with the Greek character theta, um, and uh, it's sometimes called just PA, position angle. But we need a reference point. We have to use north um, for, for that. Um, so you can see we start at north and we travel through east, um, to, to get the reference, that's 90 degrees and so on. Now from my little diagram here, we, we can't assess the separation. We don't know how big that scale is. We have no idea what that is. But the, the position angle, we could figure that out by eyeballing that. What do you think it is? What do you think the separation angle is there? What do you think? 225. Final answer? Don't want to phone a friend? Okay, 225. I agree that, that if you go through, again, east, 90 degrees, south is 180, and it's about halfway, I think, between south and west, so add 45 to the 180, 225. So, so that's, that shows you, again, from a good sketch or just eyeballing it in your eyepiece, if you know where north is, you, you, can, uh, you can maybe get the angle pretty easily. If you know your field size, for your eyepiece, you know what the edge-to-edge -edge field size is. Um, that's the true field of view, the TFOV, for your eyepiece. Then you might be able to estimate the separation pretty easily as well. But here we could only guess. Um, of course, knowing where north and west and all that is in your eyepiece can be a bit confusing, especially to the beginner astronomer, um, because F f fields are presented in a funny way in a telescope. When you even just when you look at the sky, things are backwards, right? East is on the left, um, as opposed to on the right, like a terrestrial chart. So that throws people. But if you look at the sky, north is presumably up. If you look with binoculars at some object, um, a a east is going to be counterclockwise um, from north, and that's how you would measure the position angle or the theta um, uh, from there. Um, Lots of books and websites on this subject really convolute matters. I've seen very complicated tables to explain how, how your field of view should look, but it's super simple. Um, you just need to count the reflections in your telescope. If you have an even number of reflections, then you have a rotated field. It's just north is down. Everything is going in the same direction. You're still going counterclockwise to get your position angle. If you have an odd number of reflections, which is very common in an SCT telescope and you've got a mirror diagonal um, that you put your eyepiece in or a star diagonal or a refractor and you've got a star, star diagonal for comfortable viewing um, for a telescope, when you have a uh, SCT with a diagonal, you, you have an odd number of reflections. So, if, so just count the number of times the light is bouncing um, inside your telescope and you'll, you, then you know which field of view you have. If it's a mirrored view, now you calculate your position angle clockwise. So that requires some familiarity with your equipment. You've got to think about that a little bit. West is easy to figure out, though, right? 
super easy to figure out where west is in your telescope, assuming you have an equatorial mount telescope with a motor drive, just turn the motor off for a moment. And all the stars, everything will start shifting through the eyepiece, and where they fall off the edge, that's west. Just like the sun is setting in the west, the stars will set on the west edge of the field. So it's easy to figure out west, and if you know about your telescope equipment, then you'll know where north is, and you can update your sketches or drawings accordingly, or your log notes um, accordingly. And if you're very familiar with your telescope equipment, you'll know what the field of size is, how far it is across from one edge of the field to the other edge of the field. Is it one degree? Is it half a degree? Is it 26 uh, uh, arc minutes? If you know that, then you can start to estimate separations. If you know that this is a one degree field, you can see the A and the B stars are quite far apart, almost half a degree um, here. So you can start to calculate those things pretty quickly. Here, here's what I think you need though. Of course, we need lots of telescopes. There's Bobby with, uh, Bobby Abraham um, with his dragonfly instrument. So I don't think you need that many telescopes for, for doing this. <laughs> But, but ideally, you want a motorized um, telescope. You don't need a go-to, but a, a, a telescope that can do tracking on an equatorial mount is ideal. Usually, we need magnification. You want to increase the magnification when you're looking at double stars. Obviously, tight double stars become further apart um, when you magnify them, so that helps. And then that lends to greater accuracy when you measure them. Um, part of what we need to do is not necessarily trust the quoted values um, for our uh, telescope equipment so the true field of view it may not be accurate it, it depends a lot on the telescope system and so on so it's best to measure um, your field size by doing drift timings you let the star move across the field and you time that so you need a stopwatch or a timer or a timer app if you've got a good stopwatch on your wristwatch or you've got an app on your phone if you've got lap timing then you can do repetitive um, uh, runs. So keeping notes for all this, I have little spreadsheets on my little computer usually with me in the field or at the telescope, so I'm punching data into my spreadsheet and I'm doing on-the-fly reduction of some of that data. Um, and the one thing that you might want to consider, this can be a bit expensive, so I'm starting to spend a bit of your money here, is getting an astrometric eyepiece, which has a reticule in it um, and a graduated uh, uh, scale. I've got one here and I'm going to hand this around, um, so, so I'm going to take the cap off of it here, and I'm going to turn on the, um, the reticule so you can see in it. So look inside here and see if you can see the reticule, and then hand that off to somebody else. I've got the other cap on, so keep that on so it's dark. So it's like looking in outer space. So check out that. That's the Celestron astrometric eyepiece, and I'll, I'll show you some information about that here on the screen. So you may have this piece of equipment already. Um, uh, to increase magnification, you may need a Barlow or a PowerMate. Um, and your objective is to get the focal length of the telescope, if you're going to do accurate measurements, to over three meters. Um, if you have an eight-inch SCT telescope, you're two-thirds of the way there. That's a two-meter scope. So you just need to uh, 2x times doubler um, to, to get into that four-meter uh, range. If you have a small refractor, you might need a 4x um, to measure um, double stars with some accuracy. Um, I have a 2x Barlow, I have a 2x PowerMate. We have a 4x PowerMate up at the Carr Astronomical Observatory. You can borrow though, you can borrow mine if we're near uh, each other. Um, uh, here is one of the astrometric eyepieces that's available. This one's a bit less expensive. I've seen it for around $110, $120 Canadian. Um, this one's from Mead. Um, once again, you can see that it's a one and a quarter inch eyepiece. It's got this stock sticking out of it with the battery and the illuminator um, and an on-off switch. Don't forget to turn the switch off at the end of your observing session. Um, <coughs> it's got those little button batteries, expensive button batteries um, in it. Um, you can see the inside illuminated retic reticule scale. It's got a linear scale that has 50 divisions. It's got a large circular um, scale. Um, with 360 degree markings on that. Um, so you can use that for position angle or the half protractor. Um, so there's a couple of uh, things specifically for doing double star work here. 
Uh, the the uh, thing crosshair thing here, uh, very rarely used now, but people use this when they did manual guiding for astrophotography. I, I don't know of anybody that does that um, anymore, but, but you could use that for this. There are other uses for an astrometric eyepiece. You can measure the distances between moons and a planet. You can measure the size of a planet. So th those other things that you can do, and even just telescope setup. If, if you want super, super precise go-to uh, performance, um, out of your telescope, you know when you're setting it up after you've done a good polar alignment, you're supposed to put your target stars, your target alignment stars, right in the center of the eyepiece. H how do you do that? Super easy if you have one of these. So you might be able to use the, an eyepiece like this for other purposes than strictly double star work. I have the Celestron one. Um, I actually went looking for the Celestron uh, 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 micro guide and I was having a hard time finding it. A lot of places were showing it out of stock and, and it wasn't being replenished. So I was getting worried that you couldn't get them anymore. But then I started stumbling across the Bader Planetarium micro guide and they look exactly the same. And I realized what was going on. That I don't think Celestron ever made their own. They contracted Bader to make it and then they badged it as Celestron. So you can buy the Bader Planetarium micro guide and it works and acts exactly the same as the Celestron one that's going around the room. So once again, it has the illuminator. Here's the reticule. Notice it has 60 divisions. The linear scale has a split or a channel down the middle. I like that. You can, you can do your drift timing and make the star go down the pipe. So that's kind of nice. It, it's a little bit more accurate. It's got that protractor. The linear, linear sorry, large circular scale has two measures. I don't know if you can see it, but there's numbers going clockwise, numbers going counterclockwise. So it works for the two types of views that your telescope may present. So I, I like it. Some, it's a personal thing. Some people like one versus the other. one. This one appears more expensive though. When I did some quick uh, checks online, I was seeing prices around 300 bucks or 200 bucks. So it looks to be more expensive than the Mead, but to each their own. Um, so, so those are your sort of options. Now I thought what we could do is a little demo um, of how to do um, measurement. There are lots of ways to do this. There's the Celestron way. I followed those instructions. I read, read Ron Tengue's method. I tried that out. Tom Teague wrote an article on Sky and Telescope and it was, it was quite good. It took me a long time to master his technique, but uh, it uh, allows more accurate results pretty easily. So I've tried his method um, there and built spreadsheets to collect the data and so on. So I, I thought we could um, do, do this. Um, so I'm, I'm going to run a, a Stellarium um, here and uh, just, just try to simulate this. So bear with me for a moment as I get Stellarium going. Built into new versions of Stellarium are the astrometric eyepieces. So you can actually see what it will look like. Um, in a telescope and you could do practicing or trial runs um, in, inside the software so you could practice it or get used to it um, here. Um, so give me a second. So here we go. This is the evening sky right now. Uh, and let me just advance a little bit in time just to darken the sky. We'll turn on some constellations. We'll turn on the meridian um, and uh, there there's um, there's some of our stars there's uh, Cygnus um, so I'm just interested in something here I'm going to use an example star um, uh, 16 uh, Cygni so let's try that star there it is. Uh, and we'll zoom into that. Does it look like a double? No. So we need, we need high power um, here. So if I zoom in a lot, there it is. There, there's the pair. Okay. Um, so I'm going to turn on the eyepiece view now in Stellarium. So this is simulating what it looks like through a particular eyepiece. Now I, I um, uh, can't quite read those descriptions way over there, but we have a 40 millimeter in a 14 inch telescope. Okay, I'm going to switch the oculars. There's a different one. There's a 26 mil. There's a wide field one. There, there's another wide field. There's a binocular view. And now I'm going to switch one more. 
And oh, it didn't show up, the micro guide. There's, there's the Mead micro guide. Let me back up. I tried to get the, there's the Celestron one, okay? Now bear with me for a second. I'm just going to shut off the scaling so it's bigger for us there, okay? And I'm going to increase power. So I'm going to put a Barlow, there's a 2x, there's a 3x Barlow um, in, in the um, telescope, um, simulated telescope. And I'm going to rotate, oh, wrong way. And this is just the spinning the, that eyepiece um, in the, the telescope, and I'm just trying to line them up. And, and now you can help me. Let's count the ticks from the one star to the other. I put the A in the middle. It doesn't really matter for this purpose. But I, what would you say? Yeah. So we count the ticks. There's 15. It's somewhere in the middle there. Okay. So I've got a little spreadsheet here. We'll pop that in um, here to, to our little uh, spreadsheet. So how many ticks did we say? 15 and a half maybe? 15 and a half. Okay, so I'll pop that in here. But, but what we need to do now is figure out how, how big that scale is in real space. We, we need the angular measurement of this. We need the scale um, of that. So what we have to do is drifting. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to click away from the stars for a second and see how they're drifting. So that's telling me where west is. Okay, and I'll just back up time a little bit. Too much. So we'll just speed that up a little bit. So I'm just trying to get the angle here right. And I'm trying to get the star to run along the scale. How's that? That's pretty good, eh? It's not perfect, but it's close enough for our purposes. Now I need you guys to help me again um, with, with this. What we're going to do is we're going to time this. So somebody want to fire up a stopwatch? A couple of people could do it. We could average it and stuff like that. Um, so I'm going to put the star off to the edge here, okay? And we'll get ready to start it. So uh, I'm going to let the star start moving, and when it crosses the marking, I'm going to say go. I'm going to we'll let it run all the way across the scale, and when it gets to the end, I'll yell stop. So we'll get our timings there. You ready? I'll back it up a little bit. Okay, get ready. Get ready and go. I don't know if you've done asteroid occultations, but the, the delay between when you hit the start and stop on your stopwatch, that there's delay, there's a human factor there. It's called personal equation. You have to factor that in. Get ready. Get ready to stop. Stop. I was a little bit early there. Pardon me. What was that? 15? 15, 1557? So we're around 15 and a half. Anybody higher than that? <coughs> Pardon? 78, okay. So maybe 15.5, 15.6, something like that. That's our number. You do this a dozen times, right? And you take the average, so you get a low standard deviation, um, low, low error um, here. Now I'm leaving the star at the edge there. I'll come back to that. Um, but let's go to our spreadsheet again now, and let's put in that number. So... Our time, our drift time was, say, 15.6 after we've done a dozen repetitions there. And my spreadsheet, um, doing some trig math, ooh, um, <laughs> it, it, we've calculated the, now the row or the separation in a real-world measurement at uh, just over 38 arc seconds, all right? We'll check that in a minute to see if it's any good. Um, now what we'll do is one more thing, the quick and easy way to get the um, position angle is to use the protractor. So I'm going to put the um, star on the 270 mark here, and I'm just going to move the stars over here, and I'm going to put the A star, which is the top right, as close as I can into the protractor. Okay. So you do this very accurately, very carefully, and now we start to use the protractor scale um, here, and we figure out what's going on. And again, you would look at your outer circle um, and go clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on the view of your telescope. So that's zero, this is 30, and so on. What do you think we are? We're, we're over 130. 
132 maybe, 133, something like that. Um, so it, it depends, again, how accurate we are in this. And I was off a little bit, so I'm off about a degree um, here, but close enough from an airplane. Um, so, so we've got some good, good numbers there overall. Um, so thank you, Stellarium, uh, for, for that. And back to here. Um, so what do we get? If I look up this information in Sky Tools, you can see that we get an, a separation of um, 100 and Sorry, sorry, a separation of 39.8. We were pretty close, eh? We were around 38 and something, just from that quick measurement. And we got a position angle, it was around 132 maybe. Um, from our eyeballing it, it SkyTool says it's 133. That's my SkyTool software numbers that I'm quoting here, but that's not the official source. So let's go look it up at the of official source. And we know that's the Washington... Um, d double star database. So let's let's go check it out. So here we go. Here here's the Washington Double Star database, and and the um, 16 Cygni has an RA that's uh, uh, around 19 hours. So we'll go into the 18 to 24 section. Um, this is a huge list. G again, there's 100,000 entries. This one's got about 25,000 entries here. So I'm just waiting for it to build. You need to know the discoverer. Um, name for this uh, star 16 Cygni is also known as Struve um, from the first appendix 46 so Struve A 46 so I'm going to type in STF A 46 and, and there we go here, here's the listing um, for that double star and there's two entries here it's a triple actually um, but you can see that the first recorded measurement was 1800 that's when this star was first measured. And the position angle then was 141 degrees. But now, or at least as of 2017, the position angle is 134. We were very close, just off by two degrees, right? Um, and the early separation uh, measurement was 37, but it appears to be moving farther apart. Looks like it's a binary system maybe, or the two stars are moving separately with proper motion. The proper motion, some of that data is over here. But you can see the current separation is 39.8. That was the same number that was showing up in my, my software. Um, so we got pretty good numbers, eh? So congratulations, you've measured your first double star. Woohoo! <laughs> so, super easy. <laughs> so. So with those eyepieces, it's really easy to do, except it's boring and repetitive work. You're supposed to do lots of iterations of the timing um, so that you've got good quality data. You want to measure it a couple of different ways, um, do cross checks along the way and stuff like that. Um, again, I've used a lot of different methods with those asymmetric eyepieces to sort of come up with a good technique. I've got my own workflow now. I found uh, efficiencies based on Tom Teague's method and I've got my pre-built spreadsheets and I do some cross checks along the way so I know that the data that I'm collecting is in the right direction that I'm, I'm measuring things according to the right correct orientation but still there's no right or wrong method um, that you can use for for doing this um, there, there's lots of different techniques so are you interested uh, want to do it so go out and buy or if you have a birthday coming up and how many Shopping days are there till Christmas. <laughs> so so you, you could put that on, on your list there to get one of those eyepieces. But you don't have to do that. You can measure these just for fun with detailed sketches or good notes and, and eyeball separation and position angles. You, you could do that um, pretty easily, but just keep good log notes then. But if you are getting more serious about this, getting an eye, uh, eyepiece that you can use to measure this and measuring it accurately and coming up with a good method and getting consistent um, and maybe starting out by comparing your results for a double star that's not a binary, use a non-binary system and measure it and see if you can come up with the same numbers and get good results. And we can talk about in the future how you submit that data, how you write a scientific paper and where you send it. Um, the, one of the best books on the subject um, is the Observing and Measuring Double Stars. I've had this for a few years. It's the second edition. So very nice book um, on the the subject and it talks about different measurement techniques and how orbital data um, can be calculated so you can have a look at that if you'd like um, I mentioned the Journal of Double Star Observers that's one of the clearing houses for submitting uh, papers 
so uh, go to their website, start looking at their website and reading other articles about measurement techniques and seeing papers that people are contributing, which includes high school students and their teachers. Uh, they're, that's one of the most common uh, sort of submission. They do work over weekends. Um, of course, lots of uh, resources are available online. And, and to toot my own horn, you can visit my blog and use the double star tag, and you'll find all kinds of articles there. And if we're observing together, I'm happy to help, and you can borrow my eyepiece. I'm doing more and more stuff photographically now, so I can reduce the data in warm temperatures without mosquitoes um, uh, at a later time. Uh, Th this uh, QR code, if you want to scan that, that'll bring up the article. I uh, have posted everything that I've talked about in some images um, on our website, um, so you can review that that article. And uh, I don't know how much time I've taken. Um, I, uh, uh, I could take some questions if if uh, the Master of Ceremonies will allow me. <laughs> so, any any questions for me about double star measurement? Yes. Oh, waiting for the microphone. Yep. Is that Chris? Samoa. So I assume you can do a lot of these measurements for the particular setup, and as long as you don't change your setup, you've got some of that homework already done when you when you do a session. Is that correct? Yeah. So if you set up over a weekend um, and you don't touch the scope. Um, in, in terms of the optical path, you don't change the optical path, um, then the, you can use the, the data that um, re repetitively. But thing, we know that things can happen, right? You can get thermal changes um, in, in a scope. It's encouraged that you do drift timings over more than one evening. Ideally, you do the position and separation measurements over more than one evening because of seeing conditions um, and other factors like the elevation of those stars and if you're getting uh, refraction factors from the atmosphere. So, so you can do things quick and, and dirty um, and if you leave this telescope set up the same and, and that includes you know the, a doubler that you had in it and things like that. Remember that a telescope like an SCT or designs like that, um, where when you focus the primary mirror, it, it's moving the, the whole mirror, the optical length, the focal length of the whole system changes there. So that might mean on night two, if you focus differently than the night before, if you have both an internal and an external focuser, you, you have to assume it's different now. So you might have to redo your drift times or, or to get the proper scale. And it might only be a little bit different, right? One percentage point, um, but but that could affect things a bit. And second question, quickly: um, If you're investing in astrometric astrometric eyepiece, then you've got to choose the focal length that's appropriate for this likely star separation. Is that right? And you could then go with the Barlow's or the or the power meets you, to change. You the don't scale. have any say really in, in terms of the astrometric eyepiece. The the mead is 12 millimeters and the Celestron Bader one is 12 and a half. So that's a given. But factor that into the telescope that you're going to use that with and then that will drive what Barlow or what magnification that you need um, for the Barlow or, or PowerMate. Um, so so the, the eyepiece you're stuck with, the telescope presumably, that has, uh, those are two fixed factors and then just bring in whatever magnification you need from there. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot for your time.
Hey, good evening, everyone. So my name is uh, Mehdi. So a quick introduction. Daytime, I, um, I work at uh, IBM. I'm offering manager in the field of uh, high performance computing, uh, quantum computing, and uh, artificial intelligence. So lots of stuff going on these days. And uh, nighttime, um, as soon as I'm done with my uh, official job, I'm a happy RASC member. And uh, so my background in, um, in physics explains uh, why if you put a laptop or anything that has a keyboard in front of me, my fingers start moving uh, by themselves. <laughs> if you put an helium tank not too far from me, I'll start breathing it and talk and make kids laugh. That's the second thing. But um, what I absolutely love is uh, playing with data, either my own data that I require when I have time, and I'm officially the, um, uh, the official blood bank for the Mosquito Nation north of uh, Toronto. So that's uh, another thing. I also do observation uh, winter time when it's like extremely cold because the, the sky is just absolutely beautiful. And uh, when I need some sleep or uh, I don't have enough coffee, then I take data from uh, either the big um, uh, telescopes that are operated all around the world, like the uh, European uh, Southern Obser Observatory, uh, Mauna Kea, uh, the um, uh, Hubble Space Telescope as well. I love the Hubble Space Telescope. So tonight, um, I'm going to talk about uh, publicly available data. That's the one from the uh, New Horizons uh, mission about the uh, solar system, Pluto, um, Charon, and the Kuiper Belt. So you can see on the, on the left, that's a mosaic of uh, Pluto made from the, uh, the data from uh, the New Horizons spacecraft. In the middle, it, it's uh, Charon, and on the right, it's uh, a screenshot uh, when I was doing some measurement to calculate the diameter of, uh, of Pluto. So solar system, let's start from scratch. So when I hear those two words, solar system, the, what comes in my mind is a picture. It's almost exactly this one, except, okay, the sizes are at scale, obviously not the distances, but uh, that's what comes in my mind, planets, basically, and planets that I can see, naked eyes, planet that planets that I can see with my telescope, and stuff that I really would like to see, but I can't. And actually, that's a very small part of the solar system. I did, um, or oh, one thing I, I forgot to mention, I, I also run the um, astronomy and science club at my son's school, because I, I love doing stuff, but I also love teaching stuff to the, to the kids. And uh, I did a presentation on the solar system, and uh, one question that uh, came in my mind was, okay, wait a minute, we're talking about solar system, but what is it exactly? What's the boundary of the solar system? Where does it end? And when um, basically real space uh, starts? And that's actually a very good question. So as usual, when I ask myself questions like that, I spent half of the night on Wikipedia. So w when we go back home, I invite you to look, look up. So where does the solar system end? And actually, that's extremely, inter extremely interesting because when one thing stops and another one starts at, at the boundary, it's basically um, physics processes that stops, and that's another one that, uh, that we start, and there's a transition and everything. So it's, uh, yeah, e extremely interesting, but not tonight. Um, so let's um, get the big picture of the solar system. So we'll see there's lots of donuts, so your um, uh, basically sugar level will uh, rise a bit uh, tonight. The first big donut uh, is the, um, the Oort cloud. I know it's difficult to pronounce. Uh, I it's basically this um, on the bottom left, this big uh, blue ring. And uh, it's, it's really big and it contains lots of stuff. Like we estimate up to a trillion of icy objects. So that's another word for comets basically. And sometimes one will just drift, uh, get closer to the sun and we will have a very good uh, show at night. The um, super small uh, red ellipsoid so that's the orbit of uh, Sedna, which is a trans-Neptunian object. It's not that big, 1,000 um, kilometers uh, uh, diameter. Uh, the funny thing is uh, it, it takes uh, Sedna 11,000 years to uh, go around the sun. So if at some point it gets uh, close to you, that's not going to happen again in your lifetime. Um, the, um, if, if we zoom in, then uh, we see the orbit of Senna and a bunch of uh, or orbits in different colors. So we can zoom again 
and uh, then we are in what's called the uh, outer uh, solar system. And you have the usual suspects like uh, Pluto, Saturn, uh, Neptune. And there's our second uh, donut made of those uh, blue, blue dots. That's the Kuiper belt. It's beyond the orbit of Neptune. Um, Pluto is the most massive object, most known, at least for now. And uh, it's similar to the uh, asteroid belt. I'm going to talk about the asteroid, uh, asteroid belt in uh, 30 seconds. Except that the objects are primarily made of ice. Like it, it's not as icy as comets, but still there's lots of uh, ice. And then we'll go uh, to our last uh, donut for, for, for tonight. In the uh, inner solar system, you clearly see that big ring of um, uh, it's the asteroid belt. So the big difference uh, between the asteroid belt and the Kuiper belt, so they are mainly rocky and metallic. It's between Mars and uh, Jupiter, and the largest asteroid is uh, Ceres. So that's, uh, th that gives you a nice uh, picture um, of the solar system, like going a bit beyond the planet. So I have a, another question for you for tonight, again, after those five hours on, on Wikipedia. Then why do we have these donuts, like those rings. Wh why rings? And basically, if you change scale, you have another ring. <coughs> For anyone? Uh, so, uh, okay, I'll give you a hint. You go on YouTube and, um, and check for stuff like uh, protoplanetary disk and uh, solar system formation, and you will see that basically when the cloud of gas just collapses on, uh, on itself, then it, uh, with the spin it will go basically thinner and, and thinner. And then you will get, uh, uh, like when you do a, a sauce for like pasta or stuff like that, mixing milk and, uh, and flour, you have those clumps in there and they will aggregate more and more matter and you will end up with what will be planets at the end of the day. And there's like very nice uh, simulations um, available on YouTube for that. So what can you see? So naked eyes, the moon, of course, and you can even see structures on, on the moon if you don't need uh, many glasses like uh, me. You can see some planets. I mean, Mars these days, is pff, the color is absolutely beautiful. Um, then, uh, usually, I, I do borrow my um, daughter's binoculars, and then I can see craters on the moon. That's uh, awesome. I can play Galileo and watch the, the moons of Jupiter, I mean, moving around uh, night after night. night. That's pretty nice. But I if I want to see, like, like real structures and, and, and stuff, basically, I, I use my uh, telescope, and that's why I mentioned about uh, cold, cold nights. Well, actually, it's day, but it's uh, even colder at night. So that's what you can see in terms of uh, planets with a uh, small scope, like it's uh, Celestron 8, so very small. So from uh, left bottom, Venus, Uranus, of course, Jup I I'm a big fan of Jupiter, by the way. And uh, you can see the great red spot and the um, and moon and the shadow of the moon on the, on the atmosphere of the planet. Mars, when there was no dust storm, you can clearly see some, uh, so it, it's not crisp, but you can clearly see some structures. And then, of course, um, Venus. I'm a big fan of, uh, of Venus as well. So that's what you see with a scope, but no Pluto. Oh, of course, don't forget the moon. So I was not a big fan of the moon until uh, two, three years ago, because you can get like awesome shots of the moon with a small scope, like this one, the Clavius crater. So yeah, same one as the one in the movie. And um, so it, th there's a technique, like a, a technique to take like pic planetary pictures. Usually you don't take pictures, but you take movies and then you use a software to select the best frames and you, you stack them and then you do a post-processing. So what I'm going to talk about after is not, not movie at all. It's like pictures, like uh, selfies. So you can also do science. And uh, as I mentioned, my background is in, uh, is in physics, and I love especially measuring stuff. And when I can, when I can measure something, I'm happy. So this happened like a few years ago. Um, I was out in my backyard, and pff, I was doing like random stuff. And I thought, OK, wait a minute. Oh, seeing is uh, pretty good tonight. It was not supposed to be uh, that good. So let's uh, take some uh, pictures, so movies, actually, of uh, Jupiter. And uh, what I wanted to, to do or originally was take like multiple pictures and then do some kind of uh, short animation to show the transit of the Great Red Spot on, uh, on Jupiter. And then I thought, uh, I should be able to measure the size of the Great Red Spot. And then same as for the uh, solar system, 
My next question was, uh, wait a minute, where does that stuff end? Basically, what's the boundary of the, uh, the end of the Great Red Spot? And that was the most difficult part of my, uh, of my work, finding out the um, uh, boundary of the Great Red Spot. So you see for each uh, picture, so there's a crop of the GRS, and then I did some uh, magic with my software to expose the boundaries in uh, black and white. So in some pictures, it's like perfect, clear. Some of them are like super noisy. So I, um, I used some uh, uh, standard statistics mathematics and uh, basically an average of everything. Uh, so I did the average for the 13 images. I, I knew because I, I measured my, um, uh, basically the uh, optical properties of my system. So I was able to get the scale and everything. And uh, my final values were uh, 16,587 kilometers for the uh, equatorial diameter and 10,020 kilometers for the polar diameter. Then I compared that, I did a search on one of my best friends, uh, Google, and uh, I found uh, a paper published by NASA. They did uh, the same type of measurement using uh, some pictures from the uh, Hubble Space Telescope in 2014. And they ended up with uh, an equatorial diameter of 16,500 kilometers. So that, that was pretty good and pretty accurate. So yes, you can do real science from uh, your backyard. And it's not even using like uh, uh, super difficult uh, mathematics. OK, so looks cool. But um, let's say you don't have a telescope. Uh, it's too cold, too cloudy. Tell me about it. Like it, most of the time, it's just too cloudy. Um, or, oh. There, I fell asleep before my preferred planet <laughs> shot up uh, in the sky. Or I want to see more details, or I want to see Pluto, for example. So I didn't include my shot of Pluto because that's completely boring. It's a dot within many dots. So, and that would be quite interesting to see details of Pluto. So what can you do? So you can try to uh, win lottery many, many times and then sponsor your own space mission to Pluto. <laughs> Or you can wait for someone to send something there. And, uh, and, and these days, what's, what I find actually completely amazing, every single space mission, basically whatever comes back to Earth is made publicly available. So there's two types of people. The ones who make stuff available now, when it uh, comes back to, uh, to Earth, and the ones who have uh, a data embargo for usually uh, four to six months. So that happened for the Rosetta mission and the uh, uh, 67P uh, comet. And nobody was happy about that, and I hope that's not going to happen uh, ever again. But um, you can get access to uh, almost instant uh, data. So that, that's what I call um, raw data. There's no, no correction of any kind, so it's not a reduced uh, set of data. But you can still do lots of cool stuff with it. And that's, uh, that's an example. On the left, it's the um, uh, comet uh, 67P. Oh, and actually, comet is written in French without the accent. But uh, and the picture was taken by the the, the Rosetta spacecraft, and uh, there's like thousands of uh, pictures and actually awesome pictures. You can get to a level of details. I mean, it's sub uh, sub meter uh, details on the on the surface. You can build uh, mosaics. You can build animations, and you can see the comet like uh, turning around. So that, that's lots of fun and of course, lots of time. Um, the Hubble Space Telescope is absolutely great for, for Jupiter. So that's uh, an image uh, uh, made of um, HST data that, um, that was taken in uh, July 1994 when the uh, Schumacher-Levy 9 comet uh, just crashed. Actually, some fragments crashed onto Jupiter. So you can see the two impacts here, those black things, and you can see the shock wave actually in the uh, atmosphere. So that's interesting. I was not able to find um, enough images to, um, to actually calculate the speed of the, the, the shock wave, but you can still calculate lots of things. Um, so yes, all the data is uh, publicly available, but th there's one, one, one thing. First, you need to know where to find it, and uh, you need to know how to process it. And it's, it's very different from uh, one mission to another one. So usually what happens is on the website uh, of the, um, the mission itself, they will publish raw data as soon as they come back to, uh, to Earth. And, uh, and then on the PDS, Planetary Data System uh, website, then you will have access to, uh, to 
the entire data set, the non-corrected one and the reduced uh, data set. And sometimes the difference between uh, what you can do with raw stuff versus um, reduced data set is quite, uh, quite impressive. So just to give you a few examples, um, I took like few hundreds of uh, pictures from the um, Mars rover. Basically, it, it, it has a, a camera under him and uh, it took pictures during the, the descent. So it's super easy to go on the website, grab like a few thousand pictures, select the, the one that you want to use, and you can make a movie of the rover basically landing on Mars. And it's funny because you, uh, Anna, you, you can check, uh, I put it on, uh, on YouTube, you can see the ejection of the uh, heat shield at the beginning. And then so it, it falls like this and then you have the, the parachute that opens and it starts like moving like this. And then finally, it, it, uh, just before it touches the, the ground, basically you have the, the rockets that start to, uh, to make sure the landing is uh, smooth. So that's, again, lots of fun. So that's for, for Mars. Um, and the uh, reduced data set is uh, way better than the uh, raw data set for one main thing because it's uh, basically color uh, corrected. So the colors are, are way better on the uh, reduced data set. So that's for Mars. Um, Cassini, they, they did put uh, data online as soon as they came back to Earth. The uh, New Horizons data, same. Uh, the down mission, same. Like basically these days, they all do that, and it's uh, it's pretty cool for actually for kids because the rover. So Mars is not that far, so it doesn't take long to uh, for the data to uh, to come back to us, and you can see almost what's going on that instant. So that's uh, every day you can check and you will get new pictures. So that's pretty cool. So my preferred spacecraft. So first I start I start with the Voyager missions because that's. When I was kids, I mean that was for me um, lifetime event. The the first detailed pictures of Jupiter, Uranus, and, and Neptune that was just completely amazing. Like the great red spot, like big, unbelievable. Um, then I would say Galileo, despite its uh, uh, problem with its uh, high gain antenna. So not all the data was uh, transmitted back to Earth, but the pictures are beautiful. And so when I say data is uh, publicly available. Well, I, I'm not talking uh, about the, the pictures as well. So the probe that the Galileo spacecraft sent to the um, atmosphere of, of Jupiter did uh, transmit back uh, measurements of the pressure uh, on uh, to, uh, to Galileo. And there's a file, a text file available on PDS that shows the, the increasing um, uh, pressure. And of course, at some point, the, the, the sensor just blew up. But uh, it's a uh, funny thing. Uh, Cassini, I did follow Cassini for pff, more than five years. And I think I, I watched the end of Cassini like live when it basically uh, got destroyed in the uh, atmosphere of uh, Saturn. I think I, I cried, which is not, I mean, five years. I mean, for, for, and one thing that you need to realize, we will see that uh, later on, but for the scientists working on, on this type of project, that's their life. Basically, so many years to, uh, come up with the idea, do all the validation, build a spacecraft, send it, and then get the data back, do all the analysis. Yeah, that's one, one life. Then MR1, the uh, high-rise camera, beautiful pictures, New Horizons Pluto, down Ceres, and uh, Juno is awesome. Like my, uh, my son and all the kids at the Astro Club, we did play with the Juno Cam uh, raw data. And uh, the very nice thing is this camera was um, part of the scientific payload, but it's really like a citizen science camera. The, the goal is uh, for people to play with data, and once you uh, once you um, do, you do the, the post processing yourself, you upload your, your image and uh, you're published on the NASA website. So all the kids got super excited about that. So one picture worth thousand words. Let's see what happens when you add time to it, and uh, let's watch a trailer for a movie that's been already released. There's a mysterious zone far out in our solar system. It's a region of ice worlds, some solitary, some with moons. Their names may be unfamiliar. Eris, Makemake, Haumea, but they hold clues to all our origins. And the first of these worlds, and the one we'll reach in 2015, is the king of the Kuiper Belt, Pluto. 
The long journey of NASA's New Horizons mission began in 2006 aboard America's biggest, baddest rocket, tricked out with every conceivable booster. We built a very light spacecraft and bought a very large launch vehicle, and the combination is ferocious. But in some sense, it all began in 1930 with Clyde Tombaugh, 24 years old and fresh off a farm in Kansas, but willing to spend long hours scanning star fields to find a moving point of light, humanity's first glimpse of Pluto. The dream of actually getting to Pluto began with a six-year-old boy in love with science who grew up to lead a team of brilliant researchers and engineers with dogged persistence through decades of planning and building and testing. A race against time just to get to the launch pad. Exploring the outer solar system, because it's so far, takes a lot of time. It requires a lot of patience, a lot of dedication, a lot of perseverance, but it's the frontier. Assuming all goes well at Pluto, NASA may choose to extend the adventure further out into the Kuiper Belt the solar system's mysterious third zone. This is maybe the one chance in my lifetime that we're going to get a spacecraft out there and look up close at one of these Kuiper Belt objects. December 6, 2014. We are long to wake up with New Horizons New Horizons wakes up for the last time from hibernation. New Horizons is speeding towards Pluto at a phenomenal rate, and we can't wait for it to get there. January 27, 2015, six months of approach science begins. July 14, 2015, New Horizons' long journey, three billion miles, nine years in flight, and 85 years of speculation about Pluto, climaxes in one day of close approach and flyby. You know, we're rounding third base and we're headed home. The dream. The adventure, the promise of discovery, that's what makes 2015 the year of Pluto. So everything went well. And uh, actually, there's a few uh, fun facts. So that's what you get um, on the um, New Horizons website when you look for raw data. <laughs> and that I was just clicking, trying to refresh my browser, like, Every uh, every five seconds to see when the uh, data will uh, show up, monitoring Twitter and everything. And as soon as they were available, then I, I started to uh, to dive in the data, try to find. Um, actually, the interesting thing is, uh, so when it's far enough, you get almost a full view of the the planetary disk. And when it gets closer and closer, then uh, you get only uh, uh, only pieces. So you need to find. Okay, uh, I do believe that those ten pieces will allow me to make um, uh, basically a full, um, full, planet, uh, full planet view. And so sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're, you're not. The uh, other thing is, uh, so who knows how fast uh, Boeing 747 goes? Any idea in terms of uh, kilometers per hour? How fast goes uh, 747? Yes. So it's between eight and, and, and 900. So the um, New Horizons spacecraft, any ideas uh, about the, its uh, speed? Almost there, 58. So f around 58,000 kilometers per hour. So that, that was really a, a, a paparazzi story. That stuff just came super fast, close to uh, Pluto. Bang, 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 bang. Lots of uh, lots of shots, and actually it took like months to uh, to get the data back uh, back to Earth because it's uh, super far. So that that was uh, quite incredible. And it, when it's um, that far, obviously any error that you make in terms of navigation or anything like that, then well, that's that's too bad. So that's what you um, that's what you get. Uh, when the dat data is uh, released, and uh, you can do some um, homemade uh, processing, and uh, that's what I did with the uh, raw data. So on the left it's uh, it's Pluto, and on the right it's um, uh, Charon. So that's uh, basically it's just mosaics. Now the thing is, it all depends on what type of software that you use for the mosaic. If you use like the standard um, astronomy things, like uh, I don't know. Pixie Insight, for example, that's going to take a long, long time and probably you won't be successful. So I used one thing that's called, um, uh, 
auto panel and I have a slide um, for it uh, later on. The, um, ah, I'll tell you the fun fact about Autopano when I'll uh, reach the slide. But first, uh, let me introduce you to my uh, friends. So Lori, Alice, Ralph, Rex, uh, Pepsi, and uh, Swap. So that's basically the uh, scientific payload for New Horizons. The one that um, I'm going to use is this one, Lori, the Long Range uh, Reconnaissance Imager. So it's a um, telescope that's uh, yeah, 208 uh, centimeters, so a small one, but it's um, a special one, not like the one I have in my backyard. And it's special because if you have a telescope on a spacecraft, then obviously you need to have something outside and something else inside. So the challenge here for, for Pluto was, uh, well, outside is super cold. And when I say super cold, we're talking about like minus 200 uh, Celsius. And inside, it's typically between 0 and 40 Celsius. So you need to have um, to build something with these tubes that will resist this range of temperature. And there will be no obvious dilation or, or stuff like that. So the, the focal length, for example, won't, won't change. And you will be able to, uh, to have uh, clear pictures. That's a very interesting uh, mechanical engineering uh, challenge. But NASA did it. And uh, it went uh, pretty well, so that's a nice picture of the uh, of the scope. So the second thing I need to know about my friend Laurie is um, the uh, optical specifications. So there's one way to do it, and actually it works for Laurie. It works for the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. If you want to know, oh, what's the uh, central wavelength of this filter that I uh, uh, got on my um, latest uh, HST download or any other uh, spacecraft. So to get the, uh, to the optical properties, so you have all the values that you need and equations that you need to calculate stuff again. So you need to dig a bit and find out uh, the uh, technical uh, paper that was published. And there's always a technical paper uh, published with all the characteristics of all the equipment. And in this case, uh, long story short, you can see some information here. So it's a uh, narrow angle field of view, high resolution. It's a rich equation uh, telescope. And that's the size of the primary um, mirror. They give the focal length. Um, what's the, uh, what they use for flattening. Information about the CCD they use, like basically everything you need and a lots of extra stuff that you absolutely don't need. So long story short, that's the formula to calculate the um, pixel scale on the picture. So four point 95 times 10 to the power of negative 6 times distance. Distance being the distance between the spacecraft and the, the target, which is Pluto or Charon in our case. So then you can uh, use my preferred software, Autopano. Actually, it's called Autopano Pro. So funny fact, the uh, algorithm that's used to uh, build those mosaics and find basically structures in the, in the pictures and then link them together between, uh, between pictures. So that's called the SIFT algorithm. And that was invented and developed in Canada. So hey. And actually it's in the West, University of Calgary, I think. Um, so there's um, so the version I, I, I use is uh, you have to, to, to pay for it. It's not that expensive, but you still need to pay for it. There's um, a free version. So that's not open, open source, but it's, it's free. And it's, uh, if you uh, do a Google search, we'll uh, find it in uh, five minutes. So it has limited functionalities. Um, the other funny fact is um, a nice amount of companies tried to uh, commercialize the, uh, the concept and the, uh, the algorithm, and only one was really successful. And that's a French company, and their headquarter um, is uh, something like 30 minutes drive from my grandmother in, the, in the, the French Alps. So that's a funny thing. And that's used by people who want to do uh, large panoramas. That's also useful for the big um, panoramas from, from the Mars rover on, uh, on Mars. And uh, if you want to take like multiple pictures to have like high resolution, um, uh, high resolution picture of know, your house, for example, that's what you want to use. And it's extremely easy. Like uh, eight, ten years old um, kid can uh, can just select all the um, uh, subframes, click one button, it will do everything uh, f for you, and you will end up with uh, a mosaic like that. So if you're not sure about the um, subframes that you need to include, 
that's perfect, perfectly fine as well. You can uh, basically dump like uh, 50 uh, subframes, and the algorithm will find out if those uh, subframes can can make uh, a mosaic for you. And it takes it's super fast, only uh, seconds. What takes time is the the final uh, rendering phase. Oh, I'm stuck. No. So that's the final result, because after you. Um, you do the mosaic, uh, you always want to do some additional post-processing. So I use PixInsight for almost uh, everything. So you can get uh, a quite crisp uh, picture. So that's uh, Pluto. I told you that's quite bigger than just a dot. And I can see uh, structures. <laughs> so now the fun starts. So we can measure structures on uh, Pluto. So let, let's start with something that's super easy, the diameter. Right, so I use one specific function of um, PixInsight called uh, dynamic uh, crop. So basically, I just do a crop and I see my, my box, and I can basically make sure that uh, I'm at the edge of the of the planet. Then I can rotate it so and average the uh, measurement I've uh, I've done. So there's one one trick though. Remember the 58,000 kilometers per hour, right? So the the spacecraft was moving like super fast towards Pluto which means the distance that we need to input in the formula changed, and actually quite dramatically. So to make that mosaic, and I, I checked, I was not able to find other subframes. So the, the uh, first one uh, was taken uh, when the space spacecraft was at 177,000 kilometers from Pluto, and the last one only 165,000 uh, uh, 165, kilometers from the target. So I mean, okay. Let's just do an average between those two values and uh, 171,000. Uh, okay, fine. I input the, uh, this value in the formula and come up with, oh, 2,378 kilometers. So let's ask our friend Google. So Pluto diameter, 2,377. Wow, that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, actually, this one, um, Kids at my son's school, they did it, and they found like the same same value. So it's extremely so, and that's the the fun with students. So grade six, they did the uh, mosaics of like everything Pluto, Corona, and, and and again, it, it's extremely easy. Then they did the post processing using uh, PixInsight uh, as well to expose structures. So they, they had lots of fun. And um, so grade twelve, uh, we did mosaics and measurements. So we, we, we measured like almost like everything we could find on on the surface of a Pluto or, or Charon, like uh, size of craters, like stuff that you can see uh, on the um, on the surface, like almost anything that oh, what's that stuff? Let's measure it. So lots of fun, and uh, just to give you an idea, the activity was done like within one hour. So it it's pretty. Uh, Pretty cool. So now, what's uh, what's going to happen? So in the in the video, they said if everything is fine and successful, then we may extend the mission. So yes, everything was successful. Um, papar paparazzi pictures taken, and uh, New Horizons went back to uh, hibernation. And I checked last night. Um, it was. Uh, 41.34 um, astronomical units away from uh, from us, which is quite far, and uh, it's uh, well, it's one point something um, astronomical units from its next target, which is called uh, 2014 MU69. So that's uh, another object, and uh, and. Actually, another fun fact is um, in order to find targets uh, in the Kuiper Belt, scientists use the Hubble Space Telescope to do like accurate measurements of um, of um, basically where the object is, and then multi with multiple measurements you can reconstruct the orbit, and with occultation you can even access the shape of the um, of the uh, object that you want to visit. And this one, uh, Mu69, is uh, so if I remember well, it looks like a bit like the um, uh, comet that the uh, Rosetta spacecraft, spacecraft visited. Like in a sense, it's, it sounds like two oh, things that 
collided and got stuck together. And uh, it's quite, quite big, so, I mean, let's wait for the next, uh, when it wakes up, and when we'll get another set of, uh, of pictures that, that we can play with. And uh, that's it. So do you have any questions? like to know um, how many objects like Pluto do we know beyond Pluto, let's say, that circle the, the sun? So how many exactly? I won't be able to tell you. I'll have to ask my friend uh, Google again. But what I know is the uh, Hubble Space Telescope did uh, a nice amount of measurements to, uh, in order to get the next um, uh, New Horizons uh, target. So there's, and anyway, in the Kuiper Belt, there's like many of them. The, uh, the um, the goal and the game was to find the uh, interesting one that New Horizons can, uh, can visit. But yeah, a lot. I know that's pretty inaccurate, but... <laughs> okay, thank you. And then uh, we'll wrap things up with uh, some announcements and more announcements. Okay, there we go. So Chris Vaughn's going to be uh, doing the sky this month, and Michael Watson is going to be talking about his uh, trip to Australia and uh, some of the photography that he's uh, been uh, uh, that he did while he was down there. There is one open slot for that evening, so if anybody has a project you'd like to talk about, uh, please contact Paul Markov about uh, perhaps doing a presentation that night. Our first speaker's night will be on September the 26th, and uh, the uh, presenter is going to be Dr. Laura Parker of McMaster University. Uh, we don't know quite what she intends to talk about, but in looking at her uh, website, at uh, the McMaster uh, uh, website, uh, her interest is luminous galaxies and their associated dark matter halos. So I have a th feeling that that's what she'll be talking about, but the exact title we don't know quite yet. We should have that by that uh, next meeting, though. Uh, as far as observing is concerned, our next public uh, session is uh, August 25th. Uh, the, um, uh, star, uh, the solar observing on the telescope, and as usual, Sean is going to be uh, giving the go, no go, decision about that either Friday night or first thing Saturday morning um, for that. And since the following weekend, I believe, is the Labor Day weekend, uh, that means that uh, if that is clouded out, 
then our uh, follow-up will be uh, the next weekend, two weeks after, uh, two weekends after that. Okay, as far as our regular observing sessions are concerned, first, uh, uh, the, um, uh, we have the Dark Sky Star Party, which will be at Long Sioux Conservation Area, the first clear night of uh, the week of uh, September the 10th through 13th. And then City Star Parties will be uh, the following week, uh, first clear night between 17th and 20th of September at Bayview Village Park. And uh, I'm not sure who's going to be hosting those, but again, uh, watch on the website as well as uh, on Twitter and the forum for uh, the Go No Go for each of those occasions. Uh, we do have uh, our regular outreach event at uh, Millennium uh, Square in Pickering. Uh, that's this coming Friday evening from 6 till 11. And uh, again, there will be a go, no go uh, late on Friday afternoon to let you know whether we're going ahead with that. Uh, uh, Friday and Saturday. So is Saturday the backup night? No, it's a double or matter. It's a double it, it doesn't matter. It's double well, two nights. Two nights. Okay, great. We'll keep you guys busy then. <laughs> All right. Uh, on Saturday, we do have a special event going on at the um, Carr Astronomical Observatory. We're co-hosting a fundraising <coughs> event with the uh, Beaver Valley Bruce Trail volunteers uh, that day. And... Uh, so uh, the, uh, the volunteers are going to be conducting guided hikes along parts of the Bruce Trail, uh, starting out from the CAO. Uh, then uh, we will have the Starbecue uh, kind of uh, uh, potluck barbecue going on. And then after that, uh, we have a Star Talk that will be presented to the, uh, uh, to the Bruce Trail volunteers by uh, Ian Wheelband and then we'll wrap up with uh, observing after twilight. Uh, and if you do come up for that and stay overnight, there's a $15 participation fee, which uh, is payable for Saturday night instead of the usual CAO fee. Uh, again, should be an interesting uh, weekend. Uh, I mentioned this the last meeting as well, that uh, we are planning to do a um, uh, astroimaging workshop at the CAO on the weekend of September 7th through 9th. And uh, uh, again, this is something to follow up on a previous program that was held um, uh, on astroimaging. Uh, the thing is that we will have our new imaging observatory commissioned by then. Hopefully we'll be able to use some of the images from that uh, instrument to uh, do some of the exercises uh, in the workshop. September the 15th, uh, we're going to have a national star party uh, to mark, uh, again, the 150th anniversary of the RESC. And uh, we have been invited to uh, uh, participate uh, at the U of T's back campus on Hoskin Avenue, just west of Queens Park uh, that evening. Uh, we have to still work out some details there, but uh, that will be uh, at least one of the sites that we have. Uh, we're also looking at whether we can do something here at the Science Center, but again, uh, we need to confirm some of the arrangements for that. So uh, uh, again, we may have the two sites uh, working for that evening. And uh, of course, uh, the CAO is open pretty much all the time now, so uh, you can book uh, space there. Um, and uh, it has been uh, used pretty much throughout the summer now. So again, you can just go online and uh, uh, use your RESC uh, uh, ID and password to access the uh, booking uh, form. Remind uh, you, and uh, for our new folks, uh, just a, a word that we do have a, a fairly extensive collection of equipment that's available for loan to members at no charge. We have at least two of our uh, program managers here tonight that uh, can talk with you about uh, what you can do to uh, arrange a loan of that equipment. And again, there's a lot there that you can try out before you start actually buying something. 
And finally, uh, meeting after the meeting at the Granite Brew Pub uh, uh, at Mount Pleasant in Eglinton. And we'll be heading there after we break up for the evening. Uh, the other thing, uh, just a reminder, uh, John Bodanowicz has uh, some RASC t-shirts. Uh, uh, there's a couple of folks uh, who are wearing them, and uh, uh, they're available for $15 uh, each. Uh, a word, uh, whatever your regular size is, these t-shirts are sized a little bit small. So, uh, you know, I usually wear a medium. With these, I think I need a large one in order to be... Uh, uh, comfortable, so I don't feel strangled. Uh, Chris, you've got an announcement? Yes, please. Um, Sunday we'll, evening, we'll get you with the microphone there. Yeah. The Sunday evening grass are holding a public star party at an Islamic center at Bathurst and Highway 7. I've been told to expect 300 people, so I'm looking for lots and lots of help, anybody that can come from about 8.30 to 11 p.m. on Sunday evening. I'd really appreciate the help. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good luck with that, and hopefully you'll have some clear skies for that evening as well. Okay, any other announcements? Good and welfare? All right. Uh, yeah, Sean? Yes, uh, hi, my name is Sean Lee. Uh, for those that have read our forum over the last week, I had left a message for our resident national photographers to, uh, if they would like to make some updated photos for our booth that we uh, use in our, uh, up, <coughs> me, in our uh, outreach programs. Uh, I have examples here of some of the photos that have been used in the past. So, uh, for example, so what, I'm, what I'm looking for are planets, photos of planets, uh, Mar any planets really, Mars, Saturn, Jupiter, whether it be with the moons or without, and various phases or, or whatnot. I just wanted to update the. Uh, I just wanted to update our booth with, and get some more planetary photos in there, because uh, sadly we don't have any planetary photos, and a few of our uh, visitors that have seen our booth have asked about them. So, uh, yeah, just uh, wondering if anybody would be willing to, if the, any pictures that you have over the past ten years or whatever, we can use. So. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say right now. If you have any more questions, I'll be right over here. So, uh, th thanks. Okay. Uh, those photographs that Sean has just shown, those were actually from a display that we mounted here at the Science Center the first year that we were uh, here at the Science Center. So some of these images are over 20 years old, so I think they're due for a replacement. And uh, again, if we can uh, get some new images, uh, that'll help to uh, just revive the, the booth display. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you for coming out tonight. We'll see you uh, beginning of September.